Happy Tuesday. A couple things at the top, then we'll get to your questions. Uh, as you guys know, uh, Secretary Kerry is in Brussels today um, to participate in the Brussels Conference on Afghanistan. Uh, he, I think, has met uh, with Afghan President Ashraf Ghani, as well as Afghan Chief Executive Abdullah Abdullah, uh, to discuss a range of bilateral and as well as regional issues. Uh, the Brussels Conference on Afghanistan uh, is bringing together more than 70 countries and 20 international organizations to endorse a reform program and reaffirm uh, support to the Afghan government. At the conference, donors will continue, or will, uh, excuse me, at the conference, donors will outline their commitments uh, to Afghanistan's development linked to continued Afghan progress on political and economic reforms. The conference sends a strong signal to the Afghan people and to the region that the international community remains committed to a stable and prosperous Afghanistan. And then just uh, an update uh, with regard to uh, Hurricane Matthew. Uh, this morning, Hurricane Matthew made landfall in Haiti, uh, brought in, uh, bringing high winds and heavy rain along with it. Uh, it's too early to fully assess the scope of the damage. Uh, but we're continuing to closely monitor, this, monitor the storm's progress and assess initial damage. Uh, we have also already started mobilizing assistance to communities impacted, including providing $400,000 in initial relief assistance uh, to Haiti and Jamaica. Uh, the U.S. Agency for International Development is, has deployed a disaster assistance response team, uh, so-called DART, uh, to the Central Caribbean. And the DART, uh, which is an elite team of disaster experts, is coordinating with governments of the affected countries and humanitarian organizations who are already on the ground to bring vital humanitarian assistance and logistics support to those in need in the aftermath of the hurricane. The DART currently has experts in Haiti, Jamaica, and the Bahamas. The U.S. government is also communicating with officials in Cuba, Dominican Republic, as well as uh, the Cayman Islands uh, in order to coordinate relief efforts if requested. As mentioned yesterday, uh, USAID's Office of U.S. Foreign Disaster uh, Assistance strategically prepositioned uh, some emergency relief supplies in Haiti, and it's begun to uh, prepare additional shipments of commodities from its emergency stockpiles in the region for rapid distribution uh, to the thousands of impacted families. Uh, we'll work with international partners to distribute uh, critical relief supplies, uh, manage emergency shelters, and provide logistic support to humanitarian organizations. Also, just as a reminder, we issued a travel alert for Cuba in addition to the travel warning we issued over the weekend uh, for Haiti, Jamaica, and the Bahamas. Uh, we continue to advise U.S. citizens in affected areas to make preparations immediately to shelter in place in a secure location and to follow the emergency instructions provided by local authorities. That's it. Matt? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, just just on, uh, on that really quickly, do you have in one place, can you, uh, embassy, uh, affected embassies, embassy closures, that kind of thing, without having uh, to look at each individual travel warning? Yes. Um, hold on one second. Let me see if I can find that really quickly. Um, if you can't, it's fine. But so that's okay. I mean, no, the, it, so we've not evacuated any U.S. embassy personnel. Um, what we did is we enacted authorized departure uh, via commercial airlines that was permitted for eligible family members in Kingston, in Nassau, and in Port-au-Prince. And some have departed, uh, but the ambassadors and I would say critical staff remain in place. Well, I'm, that, okay, thank you for that. But I'm you took about, more about you know em embassies that are going to be closed for business, like the, they, they can't. Uh, we'll try to get an update uh, on that. Uh, Okay. Just an update with you. Thanks. You know. And then I wanted to ask oh, on this? Uh, no, Syria. Uh, yeah, Syria. So uh, since uh, it's now been a day since you guys have suspended the con uh, um, contact with the, the Russians on, on Syria, and there's been a lot of talk since then about what potential options you have for going forward. And I am wondering if there is any clarity yet about what is possible, what is likely, when and when a decision might be made? Um, well, uh, there's, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> there's some uh, clarity uh, 
not a tremendous amount of detail yet. Um, uh, just to reiterate what Secretary Kerry said, just because we've uh, temporarily or suspended the, uh, the cooperation uh, that we had bilaterally with Russia on Syria doesn't mean uh, we've closed any doors with regard to multilateral action. Uh, and uh, certainly I think, you know, we're examining closely uh, our approach going forward. Um, and in that regard, you know, the interagency, the departments and agencies um, are discussing diplomatic, military, uh, intelligence, and economic uh, options. Uh, and we'll all have, uh, you know, these discussions going forward. Um, but I think essentially our, our view remains the same. Uh, you know, we walked away with, from this agreement uh, that we reached with Russia uh, with a certain degree of uh, frustration and outrage and sadness because we still think um, that that agreement, had it been implemented, would have provided the best way forward, which is a political uh, process and a political transition and a political solution. We still, you know, uh, the options going forward uh, that are being considered, and we're looking at the range, but uh, our stress is still on the political resolution. Yeah, but it's okay. Well, uh, I'm going to ask you, yep. well, you can take, I, I know you're not going to answer this, but I'm going to ask anyway. Yep. What are the diplomatic, political, and intelligence options? Military. Well, again, Didn't I'm not going to. Did I say military? Oh, diplomatic, military, and intelligence. Sorry, <laughs> not political. I couldn't read my writing. It's okay. <laughs> Um, look, I mean, I'm not going to get into the details. Um, you know, as we develop options going forward and look at what is reasonable, and again, not just uh, this is not just about the U.S., but I want to stress the fact that we're going to work um, within the multilateral framework. We're going to um, work with other members of the ISSG. Um, you, you know, there's already a meeting, I think, that was announced by Germany tomorrow in Berlin um, that we'll participate in. Um, but we're looking at a range of options, um, that, some of which we've talked about uh, here from the podium before. But I don't want to, I don't want to preview or get in front of anything that hasn't been formally uh, sussed out. All of those options, multilateral options only, or are you considering some unilateral diplomatic, military intelligence, and economic options? Uh, so my answer to that is going to be uh, that we always, I think, consider unilateral options uh, when looking at a situation like uh, Syria. Um, and you are now. And we are now. Yeah. Um, Thanks. But as I said, we are also looking at, you know, with the Russian channel with regard to Syria suspended, we're looking at how we can leverage and work with the other members of the ISSG. And the 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 just just economic sanctions? Uh, again, I'm not going to close the door on any options. There are all, all things are being discussed, but I just trust your preference for multilateral action, especially as regards sanctions and your meeting tomorrow with Europeans. Well, we've talked about, you know, we've talked about, I think, in, with respect to some of the legislation that's been proposed on the Hill, we've talked about the fact that um, regardless of where economic sanctions are applied, but with respect to, for example, Ukraine, uh, that it helps to work in concert with. Uh, like-minded partners and allies, as we did with respect Will to you the Will you describe the people meeting in Berlin tomorrow as like-minded partners and allies? Well, I mean, yes, you can look from the, from the list of uh, those attending. And again, I think this is just, you know, in the wake of uh, the inability for us to get this uh, September 10th agreement, Geneva Agreement, in place, it's a chance for us to get together with some of our uh, closest partners on this to talk about the next steps. Patrick well, Kerry is not attending that meeting in Berlin. He's, he's flying back. Right? It's been reported that he has meetings of the Principals Committee tomorrow at the White House. Uh, I can't confirm that right now, um, mm -hmm. but I can say that uh, I think I believe it's going to be Tom Shannon who uh, attends tomorrow's meeting. Mm -hmm. in Berlin. Mark, you just okay, a quick one on this. What, yeah, what are you? The Secretary said we're not giving up on the Syrian people and we're not abandoning the pursuit of peace. So, other than. Uh, discussing options, what are you actually doing to pursue peace in Syria? Well, um, again, I think there's always going to be ongoing discussions about the best way forward um, and looking at the various options. I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm not coming out here um, with anything to announce or anything to even really um, uh, signal as a direction we may be headed. We're looking at a range of things to do. 
But I think what's important here is that there are other options out there. There are other players in this region, and we can work, we believe, in a multilateral way. We did so once before when the ISSG was uh, first formed uh, to get a cessation of hostilities in place. No one's um, underestimating, frankly, the challenge here because when you've got uh, what is by any uh, sense uh, or definition an ongoing assault on the people of, uh, of Aleppo, uh, that that's going to be hard, but we're going to continue to pursue efforts. Mark, I just want okay. to follow up on a couple of things. You said that you have sadly and reluctantly basically walked away from the ceasefire. What was the one event, and you're in, I mean, you've talked about this before, but you could, could you tell us now what was the one event yeah. that basically made you walk away from this deal? Was it the bombing of the, the convoy? Was it the continuous bombing? What? Well, I mean, uh, I mean, it's hard to pinpoint one of that. Certainly the, the bombing of the humanitarian convoy after over a week of trying to get that convoy uh, up and, and running and ha get it the access and the papers and all the documentation that it needed uh, to get into Syria only to have it uh, bombed uh, was uh, uh, demoralizing, to say the least, and an outrage, and we said as much. But then the fact that that was followed with, as I said, a full-on assault on uh, Aleppo, uh, it called into question, I think, the very feasibility or um, reality of a cessation of hostilities, or even what we had talked about, which was a seven-day suspension, or a, rather, um, not suspension, but a, a reduction in the level of violence. We had two or three days where we talked about there was a significant reduction in violence. And we talked about it at the time. There were violations on both sides. But then if you went into the weekend, I'm talking about the weekend before UNGA for, for the UN General Assembly, it really started to deteriorate. So in terms of timeline, you know, because it, it, the suspension happened yeah. two weeks after the bombing, it really it did not impact well, walking talk, away. I, I think, again, yeah. and, and Secretary spoke to this uh, several times, you know, we continued to talk to Russia about uh, actions that we felt could be taken to reestablish the credibility of the process, and that didn't happen. And Ambassador Turkin yesterday said basically that what what sort of broke the ceasefire was the fact that you guys did not want to do something that you obligated yourself to, which is separation or separating, you know, the terrorists from the moderate opposition. Yeah. Why is that such a, you know, a daunting thing? Why is that such a difficult thing to do? Well, look, we've spoken to this many times. Right. It, 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 it's a hard thing to do um, given the circumstances, and it was only made harder by the fact that, you know, many of these groups were uh, under assault, under attack uh, by the regime, uh, aided and abetted by uh, Russian air forces. It didn't make that piece of it any easier. Uh, but, you know, that's an ongoing challenge. Isn't it true, though, that these groups Continue. were mixed with one another and, and in fact, that made it uh, easier for well, for elements like Nusra to move about and arm and regroup? But, but I mean, and some. So and, and, again, we've talked about the dynamic there and the fact that, you know, there is that uh, uh, mixing of some uh, members of the opposition, moderate opposition, with uh, Nusra. Part of that, again, is exacerbated by the fact that when the regime attacks them, uh, they're defending themselves, and frankly, as we've said many times before, it drives them into the arms of the extremists. Please, go ahead. I'll get to you, Michelle. Secretary Kerry said the Syrian regime and Russia seem to have rejected diplomacy. On September 12th, they were on a diplomatic path. Then something happened. What do you think led to the failure of diplomacy? Well, again, I think it was uh, we had a succession of events. Um, uh, that led us to uh, the conclusion that there was no viability uh, to this process going forward. Um, and you know this. Everybody in this room knows that this wasn't a decision made in haste. Um, you know, there was a rough week at, uh, at UN General Assembly, um, given some of the uh, events on the ground in Syria. But we continue to keep that process uh, going. Um, but I think at, at a certain point, the decision was made. Um, uh, sorry, the, but the decision was made that, that we felt that the process couldn't go on uh, as such. Didn't it fail after 
some rebel groups, specifically Akhar al-Sham in Aleppo, used the ceasefire to strengthen their positions. Didn't it fail after ISIL nearly took over Deir ez-Zor following the U.S. bombing of the Syrian military, admittedly by mistake? Did those things play no role in the failure of that deal? Well, again, I think, look, and I've, we've talked about this, there were a few good days um, of reduced violence in the beginning of the uh, seven-day period. Um, and then there was a series of events, uh, certainly um, uh, the uh, attack uh, by mistake on Syrian forces, um, but then followed by the attack on uh, the uh, humanitarian convoy, and then subsequently by um, uh, an increase in attacks on civilian targets in Aleppo that were unconscionable, uh, to say the least. And Look, we can talk all about the fact that some rebel groups or some uh, opposition groups may have uh, used the pause to resupply. Uh, that's a reality, and that's something that the strategists looking at uh, what was happening in Aleppo had taken into consideration. Uh, that was something that was worked out in great detail in the discussions we had prior to the September 10th agreement uh, that we reached with Russia. We all knew the dynamics going into this. But we had to get to that seven-day period, and then we could have implemented the, the, the JEC or the Joint Implementation uh, Center. But we never got there. So you have to give this time, we had to give this time to really solidify. And we didn't. And we never got to the point where we could do that. Just, just a more. few more. Yeah. yeah. Um, actually, can I have two more, please? Um, okay. Thanks so much. Uh, suspending ties with Moscow over the failure of that deal, was it a diplomatic move or a political one, in your view? Well, I, I mean, I think it was a diplomatic move, and 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 I would just note that, and we've talked about this before, it was a suspension. Um, you know, we haven't permanently closed the door, um, but I think we would need to see something, uh, some action by Russia or the regime or both, uh, that really uh, led us to believe that there was any reason to uh, pursue it again. I'm going to quote. Uh, so, so the Russian Foreign Ministry spokeswoman today was quoted as saying, and I would like to get your reaction to that sure. quote. The whole time we were involved in these negotiations in this peace process, we realized clearly that the U.S. did not have a joint position. Different structures and organizations in Washington had different views on what's going on in Syria. We were dealing with people who were changing their view and opinion every day. That was the main reason why they failed in fulfilling those agreements." End quote. Was everyone on the U.S. side on the same page when negotiating the deal? Uh, so we've been very clear about how um, the interagency process works. Uh, uh, in Washington or in the United States. Um, we think it's very effective, uh, and it creates a single policy and a single uh, path forward. But to get there, uh, part of that, rightfully so, should always be a matter of debate and discussion uh, with alternate viewpoints and alternate options being presented. Uh, but ultimately, it's the President who decides the way forward, and he makes the decisions as the Commander-in-Chief. Just one more. Speci oh, just one more, please. How did Secretary Kerry how did Secretary Kerry specifically evolve uh, on diplomacy in Syria? He was taped recently saying that he argued for use of force. How did he evolve? I'm sorry, I missed the, the so, um, how did he evolve? How did Secretary Kerry evolve in his position on diplomacy in Syria? He was taped recently saying that he argued for use of force. Well, first of all, uh, how I'm, not gonna, I'm not going to speak to that the fact that he was taped or his conversations that were private with uh, members of the Syrian opposition. Look, Secretary Kerry has been very clear um, that he wants his robust policy going forward uh, to uh, provide him the diplomatic leverage that he uh, felt he needed in order to uh, bring about a diplomatic process or a political transition in Syria. Sorry, Please. Mark, on your, yeah, answer, your answer to the penultimate question there, yes, you sir. said that the interagency process is very effective and designed to creates a single policy. Isn't the idea, once the, once the President makes up his mind and decides on the policy, that the dissenters shut up and don't complain publicly? Precisely. About, I mean, that's the, did that happen the in this case? Uh, again, on a policy and an issue as uh, like Syria, I mean, you know, any given day, if there's different elements and different dynamics to be uh, considered. And I think that, okay. you know, that always goes into... Yes. Did, it, did it create a single policy with no with, with no dissent? Yes. Okay, it did, because there were a lot of people complaining about it. I understand that there is and not that, that not so, not secretly, the not, not of whispering that. in the background. I understand that there's perception, a perception of that. But what that, I would say that, is that doesn't that compromise the effectiveness of this? 
uh, again, you know, we carried out the policy um, that the president had dictated uh, that he wanted to pursue uh, to the utmost degree that we could. Mark, uh, you talked about coordinating with the partners in the ISSG uh, uh, yep. form. Uh, <clears throat> Russia is a member of the ISSG. Uh, will they attend the meeting tomorrow? And uh, tomorrow is not. I mean, it's you know, it's made up of members, but it's not a. It's not an ISSG meeting. There is, I believe, just at the working level, an ISSG meeting in Geneva. I'm not sure whether Russia will take. Uh, I think so. I'll let the Germans speak to who's uh, participating, but I believe. But that's Russia a, will sorry. will be there or not? Tomorrow in Berlin? I don't believe so. But again, I'd refer you to the German. They're going to be, uh, and I don't know whether there's going to be a working level ISSG meeting in Geneva, mm. but that's, you know, that's, that's a um, routine uh, meeting, uh, but those are ongoing. Because Russia co-chairs the ISSG. Correct. Uh -huh. yeah. Correct. That, that means they should be there. I'm just not going to speak to the, whether they're participating or not. It's, I just don't know. Uh, my second que question is news reports said that uh, Russia has deployed for the first time S-300 on time missile system to Syria in addition to uh, the S-400. Uh, can you confirm uh, these reports? I uh, don't know if we can confirm uh, categorically or definitively yet, but we saw the announcement. Uh, doesn't seem consistent with uh, their stated goals, which are to uh, counter uh, extremists, as in ISIL and Al Qaeda. Uh, neither of which, last time I checked, have an air force. Well, and what does it What does it mean for you? Um, you know, our first goal is to protect U.S. interests, national security interests. We're going to continue to do that. We're going to continue to counter out to carry out our counter ISIL operations in Syria. Uh, and we're going to continue to protect our air forces, our air women and air men, as they carry out those uh, missions. Does it give you pause when you consider, let's say, uh, like uh, maybe targeting Syrian targets in, in, in Syria and so on, air force uh, targets? Air force again, I'm no military so on, expert. You know, I'm no military expert, Cause, but given cause these are obviously intended for, you know, fighter aircrafts and jets and, and cruise missiles, as a matter of fact. I, I won't challenge your assumption, um, but we haven't confirmed definitively. Uh, I haven't seen a Russian confirmation that they're actually deployed. What's it? They yeah, have confirmed? The, the defense. No, I haven't seen it. Uh, there's a missile called S-23, which is uh, designed for Again, you know, there are these, you know, I mean, we note their deployment then, and, uh, you know, and as I said, it's uh, it seems uh, inconsistent with their goals. Is the U.S. going to be continuing doing what it's been doing in Syria, or is it waiting for a new strategy? Well, I think so, uh, yes, in the sense that we're going to continue to carry out uh, uh, support for uh, groups uh, within the counter-ISIL, counter-Daesh coalition, uh, those groups that are fighting in uh, northern Syria to clear out, to destroy and degrade Daesh. We're also going to continue to carry out airstrikes. In fact, uh, yesterday you saw that uh, uh, as the Pentagon confirmed, there was a, a, a strike against a, a senior Al Qaeda uh, figure uh, that was carried out. Again, it shows the fact that uh, through our strikes, uh, we're able to uh, carry out uh, uh, very targeted strikes against senior leadership uh, rather than wholesale uh, hitting of uh, areas that include civilian populations. But just in general, um, we're going to continue those operations uh, full stop. And uh, with regard to uh, you know, the way forward and the civil war in Syria, we're talking to uh, like-minded allies, partners within the ISSG, and we're meeting internally as a government to plot out next steps. What are requirements that it's looking for for the next multilateral agreement? What are main stipulations? Well, I mean, again, we, what we want is, I mean, we thought we were there with Russia, uh, but we, what we want to see is um, a seven-day or uh, cessation or a significant reduction in violence, a durable uh, ceasefire, cessation of hostilities put in place, humanitarian access, which never happened uh, during the last uh, attempt uh, to every place, but we would appreciate just some humanitarian access. And then, obviously, uh, ultimately getting the political negotiations back up and running. Well, what Geneva. leverage does the U.S. still have without Russia on its own to bring towards a multilateral agreement? Well, uh, look, I mean, it's, you know, that's a fair question. I think, you know, as we assess going forward, though, it's a matter of Russia uh, being further isolated 
uh, through its actions. You know, Russia uh, uh, has been in Syria actively for the past year. Um, it said it was going after Al Qaeda and Nusra uh, and um, and Daesh rather. Um, we haven't seen that to date, at least a concerted effort to do so. Uh, frankly, it's been uh, there primarily to aid the regime, um, but it hasn't built a broad coalition. It hasn't, uh, uh, frankly, uh, built much support at all. It's only isolated itself on the international stage because of its actions, which include uh, carrying out airstrikes against civilian centers, civilian populations, hospitals, and other uh, civilian targets. So if Russia was involved in another multilateral agreement, what um, precautions would you make Russia um, take before entering into a multilateral agreement? I can't predict. I mean, I can give you broad strokes what those might be. One includes, you know, ceasing to uh, carry out strikes against civilian populations. Uh, and then also what we wanted to see uh, at the end of last week was the regime grounding its air force. I just want Please. to follow up on what you said a year ago, Russia began its involvement uh, in Syria. Intensified. Yesterday, intensified. Yeah, yeah, no, they began by, on the 30th of September right. last year, so it's been a year. Yesterday, Mr. Turkin said if it hadn't been for Russian Russia's interference, Dam Damascus today would be in the hands of Daesh. Do you have any comment on that? Um, you know, that's a common uh, narrative that the Russians uh, put forward. You don't believe that? I mean... Look, the, the, I reject that, and we reject that, because you know, while everyone recognized uh, for the past year or before that, uh, but it was one of the, 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 the primary tenets of the ISSG when it formed was the fact that you needed to, in some way, shape, or form, uh, retain some of the infrastructure, some of the uh, institutions of the Syrian government as you went forward or move forward with a political transition. Um, you know, Assad is not a future leader of that country. He can never be. Please. Yeah. Um, Turkey has been a major supporter of the Syrian opposition. It's a member of the IISG. And uh, Vladimir Putin will visit Turkey next week for a, the World Energy Conference, and he will meet with President Erdogan. Will any senior U.S. officials be at the conference? And if so, will they meet with the Russians? If not, has Turkey provided you any information on what Erdogan might be speaking, what might be saying to uh, Putin, and is, um, is there well, things you'd I mean, like we, him to be so saying? So we, uh, sorry, I mean, to cut no, you, off. Uh, you know, we consult closely with Turkey on uh, Syria uh, all the time, uh, continuously. Um, I'm sure we'll be consulting as uh, in the running uh, in the run up to this uh, meeting next week, and after that, um, you know, Turkey has played an increasingly uh, helpful role especially in the operations around their borders, uh, trying to clear out some of the borders and also permitting the counter-ISIL coalition to use uh, Indralik Air Base. Um, <clears throat> I understand this visit by Putin was long planned. Uh, I can't speak to who, what, or what level or what, uh, or actually who among the U.S. government who might be at this uh, uh, conference. I just don't have that information well, yet. Would you expect Erdogan to speak very harshly to Putin about what the Russians have done in Syria? I Honestly, I can't predict uh, uh, what he may discuss with uh, President Putin. Mark, I have to leave you. Yeah, please. Of course. I'm yeah. very brief. It's off topic. But I just say, if Tom Shannon is going to Berlin for this, he was supposed to go to Venezuela. Was he not this week? Is that still ha is that I, happening? I believe is so. I'm not sure that that was ever uh, announced. Uh, uh, but um, he's definitely attending Berlin, so that's he's not going to Venezuela. We can change topic. Can we go to the Palestinian trade issue? Sure, and then I'll get to you. Okay. Uh, yesterday I asked uh, Elizabeth on the demolition of homes yep. uh, in East Jerusalem, and she responded by saying that, uh, you know, you, she stated your position, but also said that you call on both parties to reduce tension. I mean, in this particular case, what could the Palestinians do? What would be their part in this in this aspect, in yeah. the home demolition? I mean, I, look, I, I, I think I know she was speaking broadly about not necessarily to the specific issue or topic of uh, demolitions, but we're talking about the general environment, uh, which is not conducive to creating the kinds of conditions we need to see in order to get some kind of uh, peace plan back and to do track. with with incitements or anything. The Israelis claim that the Palestinians do not give the proper permits, which they never give them a proper permit. And these, these Palestinian families grow. I mean, they have large numbers and so on. So they need to expand, which they never get. What should they do? 
Well, again, I think we, you know, we remain concerned yeah, about. Do, should people be able to build their own, in their own homes and expand to accommodate uh, their, you know, other members of the family and so on? I think we've talked about this before, Said. Right. Um, you know, um, certainly. Um, that said, anyone in the United States, I know, if they want to put on an addition to their house or, or do some work or expand their house, they need to get proper permits. That's part of having a legal system in place. Uh, but that said, uh, there should be a way. But there should be a way for them to do so. so. Is Israel within its legal right I to do that? Is Israel within its legal right to, to deny to continue? Uh, I, I frankly don't have enough detail on on you know what their claims are and what their counterclaims. I think we're just concerned that we have seen. Uh, an accelerated rate of demolitions uh, recently, and any time we see that, we believe that it's not helpful to the overall climate that we think needs to be in place in order for uh, talks to, to get started. I have just a couple more. Please. Isn't it particularly cruel to have people demolish their own homes? As the alternative to that would be just huge sums of money that they must pay the occupation authorities. Again, I, you know, um, we're concerned by what we've seen. We share those concerns with the Israeli government. I'll leave it there. And let me ask you one more thing about the, uh, the women's vote that is, you know, getting ready to dock in Gaza in a couple of days. They're calling on, you know, they're calling on you, they're calling on the international community and so on to press upon Israel not to uh, intercept by force uh, the boat. Would you call on Israel not to intercept by force this boat? Sure. This is the uh, all women yeah. Gaza yeah flotilla. Mm. Um, <clears throat> well, um, so while we underscore the need for um, international support for Gaza uh, and, and its recovery, um, we do call attention. The Department of State does have a travel warning uh, in place for Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza, and our longstanding recommendation. Uh, is that U.S. citizens uh, stay out of Gaza entirely um, due to those concerns. Uh, I think in this particular case, we would hope that the boat operators uh, heed the instructions of Israeli authorities uh, in order to best ensure the safety and security of the people on board the boat. And I would also just add to that that there are other ways to get assistance into Gaza that are accepted and authorized by uh, the Israeli government. Mm -hmm. How would you end the siege? How should the Gaza siege end? Because this has gone on for far too long. How should it end? And when should it end? Well, I mean, certainly we'd like to see it ended, you know, as soon as possible. But, you know, that's, uh, that takes uh, both sides. Uh, and certainly uh, by both sides, I mean that the Israelis need to be assured that uh, tunneling and other uh, security threats uh, that are currently posed by some of those who live in Gaza uh, to the citizens of Israel, uh, um, need to end. Okay. Yes, sir. What um, Kirby has said in Brussels and Josh Ernest has said from the podium at the White House uh, on uh, Mr. Duterte's latest uh, comments that they're at odds with a warm relationship and that. Uh, you haven't had any formal communications about altering the bilateral relationship? I, I don't have much to add to that. I mean, again, I, I thought he put it very well, which is say, you know, we've spoken to this kind of rhetoric, um, and it's at odds with the relationship we feel like we have with the Philippine people and with the Philippine government. And we have not seen uh, any real diminution in that, in that relationship. Um, so, you know, recognizing that uh, we're a treaty ally of the Philippines uh, and also that we have this strong cultural bond, people-to-people -people bond, we're going to continue. Um, see why we ask you about this. I understand. Day. Yes. I mean, it's the head of state. I understand. Are there any other countries in the world where the head of state talks that way, where you don't see any change in the relationship? Again, that's really... You have to say. <laughs> Or would you have to write it down and post it to you with a stamp on it? No, look, I mean, you know, no one's giving any head of state a free pass uh, on unhelpful rhetoric. But I think what's important is that um, any bilateral relationship be seen in the broader context. And by broader context, I mean the fact that we have had 
and continue to have good, solid cooperation and uh, and uh, productive cooperation with Philippines uh, on a number of levels. And we're going to continue to pursue that. We're not going to, uh, you know, walk away. Can you, can you, uh, can, can the U.S. Philippine relationship withstand this kind of rhetoric for the rest of President Duterte's term? I mean, he's been in office for three months and change, right? He's sworn at the U.S. President twice. He said that uh, the, the military exercises that I think are beginning today will be the last ones, although the foreign minister then said, well, no, the ones in 2017 are going to happen. Um, I mean, it's, it's, do you, can, can, can you keep your upper lip uh, this stiff for another five years or however many years it is? I'll just say in, in response that the United States is going to live up to its commitments um, sure. and, uh, and uh, is going to continue to uh, move forward with this relationship. Um, I can't speak on his behalf. Mark, you would describe this as unhelpful okay. rhetoric, uh, but I'd like to get you to specifically respond to a quote from, this was the second speech of the day after the go to hell remark, where he says, I would be reconfiguring my foreign policy. Eventually in my time, I would break up with America. I would rather go to Russia or to China, even though we don't agree with the ideology, they have respect for the people. Can you give us a specific response to See, you I, know, I, I, that type of comment? I, I do not want to get into a tit-for-tat with uh, President Duterte. Um, I would simply say that we have a very strong uh, bilateral relationship and a very strong people-to-people -people relationship. And I think if you asked any Filipino citizen, they would say that same thing. But they voted this guy into office. <laughs> You talked about previously that, um, you know, relationships are not a zero-sum game, that you don't mind that the Philippines would be getting closer to China or Russia, but yeah. does that extend to uh, arms sales as well? Again, I'm not aware of, of what they're, they may be talking about with uh, Russia or China, but it's not, uh, you know, we're not trying to make this an either-or proposition. Uh, we value our relations with uh, the Philippines. Uh, they're a strong ally, strong partner in the region. Again, we've had decades of strong relations with the Philippines. Uh, we've had each other's backs, um, and we want to continue that cooperation going forward. Uh, you know, uh, public comments, rhetoric aside, uh, we believe that the foundation still exists uh, for that relationship to continue and strengthen. So you don't have a problem with... Is I've got a lot of patience. So is that so a legitimate foreign policy and security policy, or is it some sort of... Sure. Is he being a vigilante, or is he conducting himself? I'm not going to no, comment. I'm saying, how would you describe yeah. his security and foreign policy? Oh, um, you know, again, I think at the, you know, I mean, I, he may in fact still be forming his policies uh, going forward. He's only, he's only been in office a few months, as someone just reminded me. <laughs> um, I'm not going to speak to uh, the course he may take. All I can speak to is the current state of our relations, and you know. Government to government, people to people, they remain strong. It sounds like he might be just wants you to stop, stop criticizing his plan to kill all the drug addicts and traffickers. Well, look, we're never going to give, you know, whenever we see uh, or hear of uh, credible allegations of uh, human rights abuses, uh, we're never going to give that a pass. Well, that, that I will. Let's get it tomorrow. With it. I mean, that it, guys. Thanks.